Oh, Father, I don't really get nervous for these anymore, and I thank you for that. But uh, this morning I feel kind of scattered and inadequate. And I just pray that you would keep that from coming through in the message into the hearts of your people. Um, Making disciples is really, really intimidating. And as I get ready to share uh, more of the, a list of things not to do, I just pray that you would strengthen and embolden us. And that uh, first and always you would remind us that when it comes to our souls, you do all the heavy lifting. You have always been there for my soul. You sustain it. And when it comes to making disciples and and sending me back into the world, you're going to continue to do all of the heavy soul work. And I just pray that you would encourage us through the stories you give us through your word and through the points that we're going to make that uh, making disciples is absolutely beautiful, wonderful, powerful, full of life. And it is one of the only things that we can do now that will last for eternity. Remind us of these things and open our hearts to yours this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We have been following the servant story from some 4,000 years ago in Genesis 24. As he goes, travels to a distant land, shows up at the village, sits down by the well, and he miraculously finds a bride for his master. And we've been using that story and learning. I don't know about you, but uh, I learn again and again each time I read all kinds of things about that remind me of how we make disciples for God's family. Just the very basics. And it's been so refreshing and and powerful for me, and I hope that story has had the effect on your families as well, and given us some basic principles that we can use in our day and age (laughs) to win a bride for Jesus. Now, I I started the series way back when with, uh, with Jacob's story, and it was kind of a how not to make disciples, how not to build a family. And we're going to finish up today again with kind of a list of, uh, I I think of it as kind of the servant's parting advice on discipling no-nos. Because Jacob had this story, he grew up with this story. It was his mother who became the bride. He knew the story inside and out, and yet just a few chapters later when he travels to a distant land, sits down by a well and tries to find a bride, he does everything wrong. <laughs> it takes him 20 years and there's, he is drawn out and absolutely painful the entire time. And unfortunately, most of us tend to learn from mistakes <laughs> better than we do from good examples. So I'm going to give you a, kind of a, a little buffet of five warnings as we make disciples. The first two will be on, on uh, tendencies that potential disciples in ways that they can influence us. And then two ways that we can potentially uh, influence disciples. And then uh, one final warning. Number five, we'll do a countdown. I call it friends first. So the servant, miraculously found this young woman at the well through a number of tests and using his, his soul to observe what God was doing. He went to her home and met dad and the whole rest of the family and he sat down. And uh, in traditional Middle Eastern fashion, in uh, Genesis twenty four thirty three. Uh, they, they put food in front of him and get ready to have a, a big discussion. So Genesis twenty four thirty three. then food was set before him to eat. But he said, I will not eat 
until I have said what I have to say. <laughs> and they said, speak on. Now, I want you to think about, I don't know if you have much experience in Middle Eastern culture, uh, especially when it comes to uh, bride negotiations. <laughs> In, uh, in Eastern Mongolia, I've heard, I've heard stories from our Kazakh friends that w w when we get married, it's between one person and another person. When Kazakhs get married, it's between one family and another family. And I've heard stories where the families have to meet for weeks in order to hash out all of the negotiations of how this wedding is going to take place. Weeks! Every little detail, and I don't know, even if you've been in uh, like a Middle Eastern shop, I don't think we actually bought a carpet when we were in Turkey, but uh, the great carpet shops, the first thing that the, the store owner will do is make you a cup of tea. Come in, sit down. Before we can do business, we need to get to know each other first. Sit down, let's have a cup of tea and get to know each other. You hear his story, he hears your story, and then you finally get around to doing business and he'll ask, okay now, what is your budget? And you'll probably say, well, my budget is around this. And he will say, oh, that, well, that's great if you want to buy a very small, thin carpet from Walmart. <laughs> uh, but let me show you some of the reasons, several of the reasons why I think you should buy my carpets. <laughs> and he will go on to list how valuable his carpets are, and what a good price for his carpet. And you know, you know that this family was getting ready for it. Oh, here's a big meal. Make yourself comfortable. Enjoy our home. Let's get to know each other, and let's do business. Now, you already know that Rebecca's young. She's beautiful. She's by far the nicest person in this room. And she has a great work ethic. You remember the 300 gallons? Just wait until we hear your budget and laugh and start telling you why she is way so valuable. Because <laughs> I guarantee you're not going to be able to afford her. And he, he stopped. He said, wait, I know our culture expects us to relate in this process. And he said, stop. <laughs> I'm not going to even begin this process I'm not going to start this relationship until you know where I'm coming from because this is special. Something bigger than us is going on and I need you to hear that before we start this. <laughs> he needs to set the stage. Now as difficult, and by doing that, he risked the entire process. This is the way you negotiate bride prices and set up the wedding. He said, stop, I'm not going there. You need to hear what I have to say. And he risked the entire process by doing that. True. By going against the cultural norms. He said, I'm not going to do the cultural norm thing. This is bigger than us. <laughs> now, even in our day and age, we have cultural norms about how we start and maintain our relationships. And I think we notice that there's always kind of a dynamic going on of who orbits who. And it's not bad. From, uh, we grow up and we orbit our parents or we get a best friend. But there's always kind of this tension when you get to know someone for the first time is okay, uh, well, I'm, j I'm the observer and you're the storyteller. You're the entertaining one. So I'm just going to follow you around and hear your stories and get to know your friends. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to orbit you. Or if you're the strong, charismatic person and they're going to orbit you. Think about every relationship you have. Either you're orbiting them or they're orbiting you from the very first meeting. Now, Jacob, when he goes and meets this exact same family, I don't know, a couple decades later, 
he immediately begins by expressing his, his commonality with the family and he immediately joins the family and begins orbiting around their family. And that is precisely the danger of what we could label friendship evangelism. Um, I, I'm not against friendship evangelism. But I'm here to warn you that we need to be very intentional to avoid the friend's first mentality like this servant does. Because it is possible as you begin, you really want the person to like you, you want to get to know each other, you begin to orbit around their life and you begin indefinitely waiting for the right time and place to say something spiritual. It turns into a week, a month, a year, waiting, waiting, waiting. <laughs> waiting for the relationship to become spiritual. And the longer it goes, the more you have to risk to make it a spiritual relationship. <laughs> And you're never quite willing to take that risk the longer you go. That's the danger. And this servant shows us <laughs> that it's actually much easier. It's still a huge risk. Don't get me wrong. It's a huge risk, but it's easier to take at the very beginning. Just say, wait. This is a special case because I've been waiting for you. I think that God has brought you into my life for a reason. Just right off the bat, first thing, I've been waiting for you. You're special. This isn't, this isn't a normal cultural thing where I say something witty, then you say something witty, and then we go get a cup of coffee and, and we become friends. That's not what this is. God is doing something bigger here because I'm not orbiting you and you're not orbiting. We orbit the master. <laughs> yes. We orbit the master. And the master is doing something. And I need you to know that from the very beginning of this relationship. The servant goes on to tell a story and his testimony. And then at the end of the testimony, he takes another step in Genesis 24, 49. At the end of his testimony, he says, Now then, if you're going to show steadfast love and faithfulness to my master, tell me. And if not, tell me that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. You know, that's not to say that this is a make or break. Okay, yes or no. Are we going to be friends or not? <laughs> it's not. It doesn't have to be an ultimatum. But he invites the family to take a step. Okay, so that, so that I know what this relationship is going to be like. You know, are we going to relate like this or are we going to relate like this? But I want to invite you to take a step, a spiritual step in this relationship. And the servant intentionally brings it to that point. And I think we need to as well. We need to be so intentional with our friendships, with our families, with our coworkers, do we intentionally invite people to the next step? Well, they go on and they sleep on it. And, well, they respond right then. Yes, we can see that the Lord is doing something. She's yours. Then they, they sleep on it and the, the first thing the next morning, you know what they say? <laughs> In 24, 55, 56, her brother and her mother said, well, let the young woman remain with us a little while, at least 10 days. After that, she may go. But the servant said to them, do not delay me. Since the Lord has prospered my way, send me away that I may go to my master. So very similar to the first one, this warning I call postpone the wedding. <laughs> okay, wait, yeah, I agree, we're going to do it, but I, I'm not ready yet. It's another kind of orbit attempt to, to delay 
and well, can't you just 10 days, just stay here and kind of orbit our family a little bit? You know, this is all very sudden. Uh, she needs some time to adjust and pack her things. Uh, tell you what, we'll start when blank, <laughs> right? When? When is she going to be ready? He's, they say at least 10 days. But if you remember, one of the first things that Laban says to Jacob a few chapters later, hey, you've been here a month uh, orbiting our family. Uh, what are your wages going to be? And that one month turns into 14 years. 14 years. Beware the delays. <laughs> Beware the delays. Because in the first place, life has a way of distracting and delaying us again and again and again and again. Okay, one week, 10 days, a month, a year, when? When are you going to be ready? <laughs> All kinds of things drown out our soul, and sometimes we have to stay, stand up and say no. We need to fight for this because this is a moment that is important for your soul. You cannot let it be drowned out by life. And two, we have a way of procrastinating what's best for us. <laughs> we need to watch ourselves. We can't wait until we're ready. Or we'll be waiting a very long time is it doesn't really matter if you are ready or if they are ready. His point is the master is ready. The master is waiting for us. Please, please don't delay this. I'm not ready. You're not ready. It doesn't matter. The master has, has prepared everything and the moment is now. He's waiting for us. Please, let's go to him. And if you've ever had any experience dating, you know how important a MasterCard is? <laughs> well, this servant uses his MasterCard every time. Wait, the Master. If you want to show love to the Master, then please give me a response right now. Please, don't delay. The Master is waiting. He uses his MasterCard at every turn. <laughs> It's not about me or you. It's God is doing something. Are you going to make the Lord of the universe wait until you are ready? That's not how he works. <laughs> then we move on. Those are the kind of the things that we need to be careful of because potential disciples will try and influence you this way and you need to be ready for it. You need to be bold. But I'd like to turn a little bit and think about ways that we need to guard ourselves and how we influence potential disciples. So I want to look at John 6, 26. John 6, 26. The crowds were following Jesus around the lake. And Jesus uh, answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you're seeking me? But not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Jesus was in a very difficult, uh, <laughs> sensitive situation because as the savior of the world, he fully expected needy people to come to him all the time. He wanted needy people to come to him. And at the same time, uh, because they needed him to rescue and transform their souls, but at the same time, he was really concerned about creating consumers. And this one I saw, I call consumer production. Needy people have to come to Jesus, <laughs> but he was very careful not to create consumers. Now, we've used uh, an illustration a couple times through this series, uh, 
comparing make, making disciples to some kind of a, a salesperson technique, technique, and that kind of makes me cringe a little bit. Not because it's not accurate or helpful in some ways, but because it's really dangerous. <laughs> because in human nature, it's so easy for us to reduce things to a product, a fix-all product. and a product that gets us results. So with Jesus, it's a very tempting to want to influence someone new and say, well, I've been following Jesus and he's blessed me like this and like this and like this. Right? When we moved back to the States, we were blessed with a Chevy Tahoe and an old BMW. And it was, it was amazing. But what does that communicate to the new disciple? Ugh. So if I follow Jesus, maybe I could get an Audi or at least a Subaru. <laughs> right? From the very beginning, you're selling results. What is Jesus going to do for you? And it's a way that it's so easy for us to try and manipulate people into following Jesus. And it's so dangerous because it will create consumers, religious consumers, the worst kind of consumers. Religious consumers who go to church and have all the right answers when, well, that's the next point. But the, Jesus is not a religious drive through Ah, oh, well, I, today I think I'll go ahead and go all out. Let's get the cure for cancer and uh, maybe a side of forgiveness for my boss. That's what I want from Jesus. And he's not a magic bean that somehow lifts our, our station in life so that we have new and better opportunities for living well. Uh, Jesus does those things but that's not what we're selling. We're not selling a product. We're not selling a fix. We're not selling, uh, we're not bribing people into knowing who God is. <laughs> the servant, you'll notice in his story, deliberately withheld gifts. He had 10 camels loaded with things that he brought from Abraham, who was very wealthy. He deliberately waited on passing out any and all gifts or even talking about them until after the decision was made. There was no negotiations about what he was going to get. There was no even hint of rewards. The gifts came after, not before. They were surprises. Our testimony must stay focused on the presence of a person. Not a product. That's good. Amen. A person who actively rescues and transforms us again and again and again in new and surprising ways every day. Beware producing consumers. Another one, Matthew twenty three, fifteen. Matthew 23, 15, Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. <laughs> you travel across the sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourself. Ouch. Ouch. <laughs> the Pharisees... We're making disciples. Take a note of that. The Pharisees were making disciples. But there was a terrible, terrible danger because people who are not close to the heart of God cannot make the right disciples. You might have some great spiritual experiences in your life, you might have the latest evangelistic tools. You might even know the Bible forwards and backwards to make your points. But if you do not have his presence, then you will end up making monsters. 
you'll end up making monsters. How has Jesus discipled you in your life? How did he disciple people back then? The people who came to him for healing, did he start with a pop quiz? Well, what does it say in Isaiah 58? How are you supposed to live on the Sabbath? Right answer, wrong. Good, good answer. Here's your healing. <laughs> hey, is that how he disciples you? Does he give you a Sermon on the Mount and then give you a quiz? Okay, let's see how you did on it. <laughs> Jesus made it clear that it was not about the right answers. It was about the right relationship. And that relationship was with him. Our discipleship has to focus on and rely on growing in who he is and what he does. Amen. Not on the right answers, even if they're from the Bible. Because we can create monsters. Monsters who think they know all the right answers, but they're not following Jesus. They don't know the heart of God or what he cares about. See, he gifts us with a huge role in making disciples, but you have to remember that our part is very, very small. <laughs> making disciples revolves around him doing his part. God's presence has to be there. You cannot make a disciple without his presence. Don't even try. You'll make a monster. It reminds me in high school, I played uh, a little bit of b basketball. And uh, I didn't play much or very well. But that's what makes the story so great. Because there was another Jeremy on the team and I came in at the end of the game or whatever, and uh, I actually made a basket. And at the end of the game, Jeremy comes up to me, and he raises our hands in the victory pose, and he said, Jeremy's combined for 24 points. <laughs> I'll never forget that. I, he was the cool kid in school, and he came up to me, grabbed my hand. Yeah, Jeremy's 24 points. That's what it's like making disciples. Jesus comes up to you, he grabs you, follow me. Let's make disciples. Yes. New disciple. We did it. My 22 points and your two points. We made a disciple. <laughs> he has to be there. He has to be there. Or you're going nowhere. My last point, and my most difficult point, in Matthew 7, you know, and these are taken from Jesus because he knew the dangers of making disciples. Matthew 7, 21 through 27. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Because everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them, will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fall and the floods will come and the winds will blow and beat on that house, but it will not fall because it's been founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, beat against the house, and it fell, and great, great was the fall of it. My final and, and biggest warning to you when it comes to making disciples is inaction. 
Do not hear God's heart. <laughs> Do not listen to Jesus' commands. Do not hear what he has to say and what he asks you to do and sit there and do nothing. It's the biggest warning of all. Do not do nothing. I don't pull punches. <laughs> and some things you just cannot say nicely. Uh, another instance we were coming back uh, from a village in Mongolia at nighttime. We were in a van, and I was sitting in the back with a short-term team. It was a long day of doing a, a medical outreach. I was in the back of the van, but I was in the center, so I could see all the way through the windshield. And in the back seat, from the back seat even, uh, we were going pretty fast because it's one of, surprisingly, it was actually a decent road in Mongolia. <laughs> And I saw something uh, way up ahead in the road. And so I said, uh, Surikban. I said, there's a herd. And I said it again, hey, uh, Surikban. <laughs> and he didn't slow down. And he didn't slow down. <laughs> and finally, he stepped on the brake and we hit a horse hard. Some things you can't say nicely. <laughs> When it comes to impending disaster, it is not the time to be nice. And friends, when it comes to making disciples or not making disciples, we might be heading for disaster if you are not making disciples. I gotta be really honest with you about this. If you're not making disciples, then you're not following Jesus because that's what he does. It's what he does. He says, I came to seek and to save the lost. And then he turns to us and he says, as the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Go. Make disciples. See, Jesus and I don't care if you know or if you hear your Bible. We care if you're doing it. You go to church, you know your Bible, you, you might be consumers. Who are producing nothing. You might be lazy servants who aren't pursuing the mission of your master. You might be fools building this whole life on sand. I do not want any of us to show up at the gate of heaven and to look Jesus in the eye and say, sorry, I didn't make any disciples. And I definitely don't want him to look you back in the eye and say, you seem to know who I am, but I don't know you. Uh, you haven't been following me. I don't know what you've been following. At the end of this series, uh, I'm just giving you an option of whether we become uh, an open lake or a closed lake. <laughs> uh, I had a professor who gave an, an illustration of a lake, an open lake has both an inlet and an outlet. Because water, to be healthy, needs flow. Uh, so for water to be healthy, it needs an inlet and an outlet. But a closed lake has an inlet but no outlet. Um, so a follower of Jesus, who is not making disciples, has an inlet but no outlet. Uh, one of the, uh, for you science geeks, it's called uh, an endorheic lake. It has no alley. It's basically a large puddle. Because <laughs> it collects water, uh, but over time, uh, according to Wikipedia, it accumulates erosion products. <laughs> so whether that's mud or minerals, usually that's salt. So uh, a famous example, 
would be the Dead Sea in Israel. The Dead Sea has no outlets. The Dead Sea has eight times more salt than the ocean. Nothing can live in it. It's a dead sea because it has no outlet. <laughs> and over time, it's becoming more and more and more toxic. Now, instead of using that extreme example, <laughs> let's use the best possible example. If you are a closed lake who are not making any disciples, what is the best you can be? And another great example that we have is Crater Lake. So Crater Lake versus the Little Lava Lake. So Crater Lake uh, has some things going for it. It's a closed lake, no outlets, but it has extremely high elevation, so it doesn't get a lot of erosion because it's the highest thing around, <laughs> and it's very, very deep. So it can take, accumulate a lot of toxicity <laughs> because of its depth. So to be, a, to be a, a disciple like Crater Lake, you would have to be like a monk living on a mountaintop who is absolutely pure in meditating in the presence of God all the time. And people from all over the country come and visit you to, to see what your discipleship is like, what it's like to follow Jesus. And they just come and they watch you meditate. <laughs> that is the best possible closed lake that we could even imagine, is if your soul is so pure, so pure and so close to the heart of God that people come from everywhere just to, just to watch you. Now let's compare that to the Little Lava Lake. Crater Lake is about, on average, 1,150 feet deep. The Little Lava Lake is 20 feet deep. <laughs> Crater Lake is 57 times deeper. Crater Lake is about 19,000 acres. The Little Lava Lake is about 138 acres, which makes it 138, which makes Crater Lake 138 times wider, bigger. Crater Lake gets over 700,000 visitors per year. What impact does the Little Lava Lake have on us. The Little Lava Lake is uh, the main source for the Deschutes River. If you take uh, the population of the counties of the Deschutes River, uh, Deschutes, Jefferson, Wasco, it's about 175,000 people, but it's 175,000 people who are impacted by the Deschutes River every single day. So if you take 175,000 people times 360 days a year, it's 63 million. So because Little Lava Lake has an outlet, the Little Lava Lake has 90 times the impact on people that Crater Lake does. 90 times more impact because it has an outlet. Now, I haven't been to the Little Lava Lake. I didn't I even, I don't think I've even ever heard of it before this week. <laughs> and that's okay because it's just like our nameless servant from 4,000 years ago. It's not about him. It's about his outlet. It's about the impact he had on God's family. He was unimpressive, but he had a vital role for God's family. We're not all that impressive. <laughs> you and I have a vital role for Redmond, Oregon. That's good. Yes. Our discipling outlet will have a huge daily impact on the people that we live with as we learn to exercise our souls <laughs> like the servant did. And as we become aware and don't let life delay us, <laughs> as we intentionally learn to invite people in our relationships to take the next step, as we resist 
trying to hurry up the process and bribe them along the way. Or as we resist drawing out the process until they know all the right answers first and we know they're ready. <laughs> In this community, we practice following Jesus. Yeah. We go with his flow. <laughs> And it, when he opens up an, an outlet in our lives, we're ready. We will be ready because he is ready. We'll be ready to go where he's going and do what he's doing. Amen. Amen. In your relationships this week and in the weeks to come, may you find the courage to risk some of what you have for what Jesus can make it into. Go with him. Amen. Amen. Amen.